I come from a little bit different of a world. I am an engineer who was trained by doctors and nurses. I was not, uh, I, I've spent the majority of my career actually in the clinical environment implementing clinical systems. Um, so I tend to have a little bit different approach um, of what, what is needed and what's necessary um, to go forward. But so right here is the challenge that's being put forward in healthcare right now is to develop and implement an open, safe, and effective interoperable systems of systems based on clinical requirements which enables the creation of evidence-based improvements in clinical care. Right now, we have a huge, a, a natural system that has occurred in healthcare that was put together by doctors and nurses and, and, you know, and IT staff, and none of it was actually really designed. It's never been built from the ground up. It's always been implemented as you get a new piece of technology, you just figure out how it fits. Um, I spent the majority of my career trying to figure out how it fit. Um, it's not exactly the best way to do it. So one of the things you see is this is a list of high level requirements that's being put together from the provider community, that they have complete and accurate data. Um, we have safe systems, and that's a very loaded two words right there. I completely understand it, but we don't, that's not my talk for today. <laughs> um, they want to have secure systems. At this point, security has become an issue um, for most of the medical systems. And, the current technology that's in the environment doesn't even have a capability of being secure besides just isolate it. Um, they want increased efficiency. Um, this is either through clinical workflow or from support staff looking at device and systems maintenance. Um, they want improved quality. Um, this has to be a flexible system. Healthcare has many different facets, um, inpatient, outpatient. Um, now it's moving into home, it's moving into mobile. They all have to be able to communicate and talk with each other and actually interact. Um, you have to be able to deal with new and legacy equipment. Medical devices stick around forever. Um, there is medical devices that I started my career that when I showed up after all of my undergrad, all of my graduate school, I was in high school when they bought that piece of equipment. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Actually, some of them were before that. Um, and it has to be scalable. Um, hospitals and systems are becoming larger and larger, and it needs to be able to, to work you know, from a single patient office practice to you know, your 1,200 bed or 1,500 bed hospital. Um, and they want to be able to facilitate decision support and data visualization. Right now, the clinical environment, the, the, the glue that puts everything together is actually the person. Um, and every system engineer should cringe when you say that, but that's the pure fact. The person who's making the decision making, the person that's deciding something has gone wrong is the person. And there's a, the myth that people can do that better than, than, than automation, people can do that better than technology and healthcare. Um, and that's actually a pretty tough cultural barrier to get across. Um, and so one of the other things that, that I actually am usually challenged with is um, when you meet with a bunch of uh, engineers, they've actually never seen the clinical environment. You don't get to just go walk through the hospital and take a look. So this is what you see when you see some really great clip art of what the hospital looks like. You see this, you see this, you know, or you, you turn on your TV, you watch a TV show, and, and this is what the hospital looks like. Um, no, this is actually the same thing. <laughs> um, and I actually, um, these pictures actually came from Dr. Julian Goldman at Mass General. He was actually kind enough to let me use some of his massive photo library. And, so if you look at this picture, you see devices and pumps and stuff. But the one thing that caught my eye in this picture is right here. So okay. that is how they say who the patient is, where they came from, and where they need to go. It's a piece of paper with a Sharpie. <laughs> this is one of the top hospitals in the country. This is how it works. This is the workaround because they don't remember how this works. This is an OR. This is an OR that's actively in surgery. Now, the piece here is you say, oh, great. You have all this technology and all these pieces of equipment. You think they actually talk to each other. They don't. How do you know what's going on in this room? Let alone, you know, not trip over a cable and a wire. And when something actually doesn't work right, how do you actually figure out what's not broken? That was my previous job before Kaiser, is I was the one that got there before DocBox um, when I worked for Kaiser Permanente, was to actually find out wh where that plug was. What was wrong with this? How does this system actually work going forward? Um, some other views. Um, so you say, oh, but we have, you know, uh, medical device vendors are selling us solutions. There's an enterprise solution. We now have data. We have information. The problem is they're our proprietary. 
But if you look at these two pictures, this is infusion pump swamp for one patient. None of these pumps actually talk to each other. And there's actually three different vendors that sell these three infusion pumps. So there's no way that they're ever gonna talk to each other right now in the current system. So you have no idea what medication's actually being given to the patient, besides maybe down the road, if they had all the clock times correct on all these devices, so you actually knew what the order of things actually occurred. So, and, and this is what they call a pump tree because of the amount of medications being given for a patient. And this is actually a really sick patient, so um, not everybody has this many pumps, but this is quite frequent as it occurs. Um, so more pictures of the, the OR of what you're seeing and what's going on. But as I said, now you have all these people you've added to this conversation in this story. And how, do those, how does that interact with each other? What are they supposed to be doing? Are all these people just, they're not just standing around watching, they all actually do have a role of what they're supposed to do and what's supposed to happen. So besides you know, the obvious of what you can see, here's some of the, I call them problems, some people call them challenges. We have, right now the latest number is 400,000 people die a year from medical errors. That number 10 years ago, actually 14 years ago now, was they said probably 99,000 people. The numbers really, the numbers keeps going up. But we've started to implement more technology, more IT systems that were supposed to be safer and make things better. Um, Leapfrog Group came out about six months ago, said it costs $5,000 to $7,000 per hospital admit is the tax for adverse events that cause, occur to patients. Data is incorrect and inaccurate, um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. Most of the data in your medical record is actually not right. Um, it lacks context. You send a heart rate, well, which heart rate is it? There's 17 physiological heart rate values that could be sent to the medical record. You can't compare them to each other, but it goes into your IT systems as just being heart rate. And there's no model, there's no data model for these systems. There's a few standards out there, they're not implemented, they're not deployed across, and that data model has to describe the patient. It can't decide, um, describe that vendor's standalone signal individual device because then you lack context if you don't know what else is going on with that patient. So some of the current solutions, they're vertically integrated, they're proprietary, um, they lack data models, they're, most of them are, um, sadly to say, serial ports with some ASCII numbers that come across. Um, I think the medical device industry is the only industry that's keeping the, the serial RJ, you know, RS-232 industry actually alive at this point. <laughs> um, they lacked correct timestamps. Most medical devices can't accept any type of network time. They actually can't even get on the network most of the time. And they, they, lack, they lack contextually complete data. Um, and alarms, so all the beeping and the noises you hear in the hospital, the reason they get alarm, ignored is most of them are limit alarms or they're from a single source. There is no way to actually fuse that alarm together, together to start having uh, more intelligent alarms on what you're going on. So you guys say, and this is probably where I'm gonna get a little controversial, but that's okay. What about electronic health records? They're supposed to solve all the world's problems. Um, what about big data that everyone's talking about now that we're gonna mine the data in the electronic health records? Um, what about all these quality measurements that they're using? Well, let's take a look at some evidence. Um, this is a screen, and I was multi-vendor, so as I know some of you guys are in the room, I wasn't picking on any one vendor, they all have different problems. This is a central station image of what a nurse or doctor's actually seeing um, on a patient that's coming through. You could have up to 320 variables coming off any single one patient. None of those actually correlate to, with each other to make a decision. They're all individual components. Um, there's some reasons to that. Some of them you know, are claimed to be regulatory. Some of them are claimed to be other things, but this is the fact, is that's what you're supposed to look at to actually make a decision of what's going on. So, um, a couple, all of these examples, we actually are real examples. These are nothing that we've made up. These are things that have actually been found. Um, this is actually a system where um, during operating time, if you're giving heparin administration, about 30 minutes, exactly 30 minutes after you administer the medication, you're supposed to do a lab value to make to check clotting time. And um, this actually is an event that occurred that they checked the clotting time at exactly 30 minutes. It got put into the record at 22 minutes. Why was this? Because the lab machine that they were the point of care lab machine was eight minutes. Uh, slow on the clock time. That actually got put into the patient's electronic medical record. If something had actually happened to that patient, it would have come back that the physician hadn't done what they were supposed to do because they hadn't waited long enough to do it. 
Um, this had been set up like this for two years, three years, before anybody noticed that the clock time was wrong. The next one is you actually have an image of an electronic medical record here. And um, what happened was that the blood pressure cuff and the SpO2 sensor, the finger clip, um, actually were on the same arm. So every time the blood pressure cuff went off, as you can see um, where the red circle is, you would actually lose your SpO2 value. And it would document it into the electronic medical record of what that time was. The system didn't know the blood pressure cuff went off. They had no idea what this value was. That's their permanent record. Why is there this anomaly? What's going on here? This is the data that everyone's mining right now. This is the data that everyone's looking at and they wonder why they're not finding the results that they want. This is another one. This is a pulse oximeter. Um, and there's a setting in the pulse oximeter that allows you to average data. That averaging of data gives you um, better, you know, gives you cleaner signal, um, decreases the amount of alarms. The averaging time is kept high. What we ran on the other side is a simulator in the lab to actually look at this pulse oximeter um, value. So we desatted it from 99 to 70. Um, at that time, we got three different values. Those are the three different values that actually showed up with the three different averaging times. The averaging time is not documented anywhere outside that medical device. You have no idea what it is. Um, it's about three levels deep in the settings, so it's not, ver it's not usually changed unless it's someone who actually is pretty sophisticated with the devices to change the averaging time. Um, but studies suggest that a, a neonate um, can have desaturations that occur within six seconds. So you can actually have pretty substantial changes in physiological state that occur really, really quickly that get averaged out. So you never actually see those in the record. Once again, this is the data going into our IT systems that we're using to make, to have a sense of what's going on. Another example here is you see here the SpO2 value is low and there was an alarm and it was 84. The bottom is the electronic medical record. There's no indication whatsoever that something happened. These, these quick early desat desaturations on a patient are usually indications that something's going wrong, that there's a problem with the patient, usually sometimes hours before the patient actually has cardiac arrest or respiratory depression. But they're missed because there isn't a clinician sitting at the bedside looking at every single value. They're looking at the medical record. They're looking at the trend screen. They don't ever see these. They disappear. And part of this is, is actually here, and this is pretty basic engineering data collection. It's the fact is that these medical devices collect data at a pretty high frequency. I mean, not super high frequency, but could be, you know, 500 times a second, could be, you know, quicker, faster or slower than that. The electronic health record is collecting data once a minute. At what point are they collecting data? Where is it at on the cycle? You actually have no idea. So you could collect, so one of the problems is you could actually collect the averaging data at the bottom that you, you know, your averaging time is just off, but you're kind of close there. I mean, it's not too bad. But where else could you collect it on that cycle? The value you could collect it could anywhere between 98 and 75. But the difference between 98 and 75 is a patient with brain damage and one that doesn't have brain damage because you didn't monitor the patient correctly. So essentially, you know, the story of this is, so basically, this is garbage in, garbage out. The data we're collecting just doesn't, it's not valuable data. There's not enough context, there's not enough granularity. Um, a lot of times the data is only collected every four hours. You have no idea what's happening, um, what occurred over that four hour time period. And then, and the other part of it is if something does happen to that patient, you don't have any information to go back and actually look and see what did happen and see what happened now. So um, actually, and you know, I'm glad you brought up the systems engineering stuff. In 2004, the IOM published a report that said we need systems engineering in healthcare. It's 2014 and in 2004 I was told, 10 years, we'll have this in 10 years. Uh, now, I'm still being told 10 years, we'll have this in 10 years. Um, the bottom line is the future's now. We have to do this now. This is a, a huge substantial cost in healthcare. We can't even find out what we're doing wrong for improvement because we don't have any information. So where does this start? So over the last 10 years, um, as in my former job and in the current job, we've been working on requirements, requirements, requirements. Um, doctors don't give you requirements. Doctors tell you a story. And you have to parse that story out of the story that the, the requirements out of the story they give you. Um, hospitals are really, really bad 
at actually telling you what they want. They're really, really good at telling you what doesn't work. But if, you, if they'll tell you it doesn't work, if they ask you what you want, if they ask them what they want, they don't know how to answer that question. They're not, they, and a lot of times they give you a, well, I call it the blue button problem. They're like, well, if you change this button to be blue, then all my problems are solved. Um, and you have to really ask the question of why. Why do you need that button to be blue? And normally then there's a 40 minute story of why that button needs to be blue. They've just solved the problem for you. And don't, because they, they solved the problem for what they think they have and what they think the capabilities are. Um, they have to consider the system. You can't design a medical device thinking that it's gonna operate in, an, in, a, in a vacuum. That medical device becomes part of this system that you saw in the pictures. And how do you design that device to actually be part of the system? We have to rethink the architecture. Right now the devices commun who communicate, they talk peer to peer. There's one other device that can get communication from that system. Or they say, oh, well, we'll send it to a gateway, but it's still a peer to peer communication. Um, there has to be open communication across vendors. Right now there's no nomenclature, uh, you know, no semantic interoperability. There's very little protocol, there's no protocol interoperability. And everything has to be, you know, a driver and a protocol change and a set of information written down. And this isn't just at the EMR level. This is actually at every single device also. Um, it has to be a learning system. These boxes, I need to have a, the bedside needs to have a black box recorder. You should be able to, when you have an adverse event or when something bad happens, go back and be able to figure out what actually happened with data. I know it's a really novel concept, but, <laughs> you know, in healthcare, anywhere else, they already have it. Um, there's regulatory considerations here. This is one of the big challenges. How do you build a heterogeneous interoperable system that's gonna get cleared through the FDA or for the, through the European Union? Because right now, the solution is, we'll buy all of our stuff. The problem is, is there's no one vendor that sells everything. So even if you bought all of their stuff, you're still not gonna have the system you need. And internal to a lot of the vendors, their stuff actually doesn't talk to each other either. Um, and we have to model the data. You don't model the device. You don't model your parts of your system. This is all about collecting data on a patient. The data you're collecting on that patient should be the model. It should be looked at as a model for, um, you know, a data-centric model of this is what's occurring to this patient in any given instance in time. It's not mo about modeling an infusion pump or a CT scanner or something else. It's about modeling the patient. Because if there's no patient in the CT scanner, no one really cares. If there's no patient hooked up to the infusion pump, no one really cares. So in uh, to January of 2010, there was actually a standards published um, under ASTM called F2761 that was um, both the hospital systems and the providers, but led by the provider community that came forward and said, this is the functional component that you need for an integrated clinical environment. Um, this was, here's the, you know, basically the categories of different things we need to have to have a system that's learning and smart and going forward. And, you know, in a beautiful way, this came across as a very good data-centric approach to actually looking at healthcare. You have medical applications. View them as a medical device, a decision support algorithm, a smart alarm algorithm. They should be able to all collect, get whatever piece of data they need on the system and be able to act on that data as it goes forward. You know, why are we, you know, why, are ni why is 19 people a day dying from a PCA overdose when all you have to do is pause the pump? They're not gonna die if they don't get morphine. But right now they're saying, well, we can't do that. There's no way to do that to go forward because you don't have that, um, this capability of actually understanding and have enough data around the rest of the system to know that it's actually morphine that's in that infusion pump. So you can pause it and it's okay. Um, and that's the example I have. These are different pieces of data that are actually needed to build a PCA algorithm that's a smart system. And I apologize, you can't read the letters very well. But, um, you know, there's lab results, there, there's patient history information, there's physiological parameters, there's the, the medication list is required. And the medication they were on 24 hours ago was also required for that algorithm to make sure it works properly. This is not a system that's just oh, well, we're gonna monitor the patient when they have respiratory depression that's positive. The algorithm changes by what's wrong with the patient. It changes with the diagnosis. Right now, we don't even have the capability to figure this out because we can't collect the data in a way that you can actually look at this. 
So when you start to look at that, so one of the key concepts in the, the ICE standard is there's one ICE per patient. And you start at the point of care. You don't start at the enterprise. You don't start at the high level. You start at where you collect the data and collect the data in a good way. Because once you collect the data, you can always get rid of some of it, but you can't reinvent the data you don't have. So these systems actually, um, you know, you have an ICE, this one per patient, and those are then managed by an ICE coordinator, and then you can actually pull out the rest of the, you know, hospital IT systems and actually integrate that information together in a way that you can actually look at this. Um, if you notice the electronic health records, that little box in the corner, because it's a data storage. It's not your real time system that you need to have this information now. It's important, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. The rest of this has to be built out in order to actually do the stuff that we need to do. Um, partially is because, um, you know, as of recent events, electronic health records aren't medical devices. They're not safety critical systems. They're not designed to be safety critical systems. Don't make them be one. Um, so if you look at this as a, another view of this architectural diagram, um, this is actually some work that's being done in the open source community as well at DocBox of looking at um, creating, using, using OMG's DDS to say, look, we can do this um, in a data-centric way where we can run clinical decision support applications and medical devices and system services and they can all run together in a way that works um, extremely well. And then your doctor can innovate. He can design a new decision support algorithm. They can look at the data and see what needs to be. It becomes modular. You don't have to buy a huge set of capital infrastructure you're going to have for the next 10 years and you can't modify it and you can't change it and you can't develop. And as a researcher, you can't go forward and actually start to innovate on top of this layer of data that you actually have. Um, and this can actually happen, you know, at the, at the point of care. It can actually happen at the hospital unit. This is scalable and it moves up through the system um, to the point where now you can have a data warehouse. You have a really, really, really rich set of robust data that currently doesn't exist right now because you don't have waveform data, you don't have the alarm information, you don't have all the, and you don't have the context around that. What was the nurse seeing at the time? What was their notes? All of this has to come together to actually make a system that you can understand what's going on. And it comes down to, um, you know, what I had stated before, that DDS bus is actually your patient model. It's what's happening at that patient at any given instance in time. It's what's happening with the infusion pumps. It's what's happening with the patient's physiological parameters. All of that becomes one um, big system and one big story. And so you say, you know, as I said before, what about big data? Well, this actually enables everything flowing downstream because you now have a complete and accurate set of data at the point of care that can be used for unit level analytics, hospital level analytics, um, clinical studies, outcomes analytics. It's more data than you've ever, than you can ever think of. It's actually the big data that occurs in healthcare. Um, so I, some of the work that we have is, this is an image of um, a subset of the data model and the data information model that's being developed um, jointly by DocBox and Mass General and other collaborators um, through some defense and NIH funding of what does this data model and what's this information actually look at. Um, this tool is actually a tool that we borrowed as open source out of the DOD that they've been using for infrastructure um, analytics um, going forward called CMOS. Um, and essentially you can look at this, but what's in this data model? Well. You now have the measurement that's coming from the device. You have the device. You have the patient, because it's a single patient. You have the user. You actually have when the user logged in and out. So what kind of information does this give you? Well, suddenly, and this is just one example that was a simple example um, that I gave, suddenly you can look at staff utilization. You can look at how much time did they actually spend at the bedside and what did they do? You can look at how much time, how many hours were on every single medical device. One of the biggest problems right now in logistics and hospitals is where are our medical devices? How much time are they used? How many do you buy? Right now it's a guess. It says, well, we had 20 before, so we'll buy 20 this time. Um, what happens if you knew how many hours a day were used for infusion pumps? You could actually calculate how many infusion pumps you needed to buy. You could actually calculate how many ventilators you needed. Instead of having extra equipment or not enough equipment, it could also allow you from a big public health perspective, if you go back to the bigger story, to say one of the issues right now, and if we have a natural disaster or a natural incident, they just pack up ventilators and ship them across the country. 
well, how many ventilators are being used? Can you have an early indication of that? Right now, you don't know. You make a phone call and you say how many ventilators are being used, and the hospital material management says, ah, probably about 10. They don't know the five that were sitting in the hallway or the nurse that's running around looking for one. You should be able to just log into the system and say, well, in the last 72 hours, we had this many ventilators in use. That's the type of information, that's the type of data, that's the granularity that we have to have to be able to improve healthcare. We, we, it, it's not about an incremental change anymore. This is about redesigning the point of care to get the data for everyone else. If we can't collect the data at the point of care, if we don't have the information where the action happened, having data that's two and three times removed is not going to help us. There's too many gaps, there's too many holes, there's too many questions. You can't answer these questions going forward. Um, and I think I'm just going to see if there's any questions. Um, this, is, this is the world I've lived in for the last 10 years. What's this supposed to look like? How is this supposed to go? <coughs> Um, there's actually a lab here in the Boston area um, at Mass General Hospital that's been doing this research under both DOD and NIH funding to look at this in an open way. Um, it's an open lab. Um, anybody is welcome to join. They do now have um, a source forge site for code to be downloaded, for data drive, device drivers to be downloaded, to information to be used. Um, last week at uh, Smart America, there was actually announced an app challenge that came out of that program to say, go build a new healthcare app and take a look at it. Um, and that's, you know, that's the, the step forward. This is the providers now saying, enough's enough. We need to actually have help here. We need, and this is systems engineering 100 times over. Um, whether they call it that or not, um, you know, because it's healthcare, so. If there's engineering in the word, it's a bad word, kind of. But um, <laughs> uh, you know, th this is the this is where the future has to go. This is how we have to get this information and this data going forward. So, and 